Good afternoon. I am Trinace Regg, School Board Chair, and the administrative, informal, and workshop session of this meeting of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, is hereby convened at 4 o'clock on this 25th day of April 2023. Members of the public will be able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on schoolboardvbschools.com slash meeting slash live broadcast on VBTV channel 47 and on Zoom. Thank you to those that have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex Einstein Lab are Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, Ms. Melnick, and Ms. Owens. Okay, and um, we have Dr. Robertson in um, Dr. Spence's seat for right now. Uh, Dr. Spence is returning from the uh, VSS conference in Roanoke and he's about an hour away, so that's a long drive. He'll be here for the regular meeting. So thank you, Dr. Robertson. And um, Madam Chair, um, Ms. Martin just um, logged on by Zoom. Okay, thank you so much. She is out due, she's out due to illness, so. Okay, so we're gonna start with the School Board Administrative Matters and Reports. Um, Dr. Robertson has one he wants to share. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had the opportunity today to attend the Access College Foundation Award Ceremony with Dr. Walter Brower, Senior Executive Director of High Schools. And uh, it was at the Ted Constant Center, Chartway Arena at Old Dominion University. There were well over 2,000 students from across the 757, but by far the largest contingent was from Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And um, a number of our students received uh, scholarships that were announced today as part of that program and a number received uh, scholarships today that were not one of the ones that were chosen to be pre presented today. But it was a phenomenal event, um, and just a big shout out to the Access College Foundation that makes college affordable to many of our students. Thank you. Thank you for um, attending that. We really appreciate it. Um, is there anybody else that needs to say something? Uh, yes, Ms. Swings. Yes, Madam Chair and colleagues, I will be asking to amend the agenda later on in the formal meeting. Just and I've talked with some of you, but but I was not able to get um, all ten of you. But I just wanted to give you the heads up. I'm going to be asking to um, remove item 12E on information, and that is the um, bylaw discussion of the student represent representative. And I would like to ask you to defer it for workshop. Um, I have talked to the three members of the PRC committee and the last meeting they all three voted to have this at workshop and I think it does require a workshop because we've got lots of questions and discussion to have so I hope that we can um, remove that and add it to workshop but we'll handle that in the formal meeting thank you anybody else okay um, I want to share uh, last night uh, Miss Anderson and I went to Smithfield High School to attend the um, spring regional um, BSBA Tidewater uh, Forum. And um, they always have an art contest for our students. And uh, guess what? We won all three. Uh, we won the elementary, the high school, and the middle school first place for all three. So yay. Uh, it was phenomenal art. Um, like Bev said, she goes, I was almost embarrassed, but she goes, I couldn't be. <laughs> but anyway, it was a wonderful meeting. We will be presenting that uh, at another meeting, at a regular meeting with our students. And um, the speaker was Dr. Gordon. He's the superintendent at um, in Suffolk. Awesome, awesome, awesome speaker. He was just wonderful. I'd love to have his um, the video of his presentation because it was fantastic. It's something all of us could see and use. So it was awesome. He has a book too, so I wanted to share that. All right. Um, we're going to go with no one else needs to speak, okay, or share. We're going to go to B, the new science standards update. Welcome, Dr. Kip Rogers, our chief academic officer.
You would think I would remember to push the button. I've done it so many times. Good evening, Chairman, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, school board members, and Dr. Robertson. This afternoon, we have a high-level overview of the new science standards, and I am going to invite Dr. Lorena Kelly, who is our Executive Director of Elementary Teaching and Learning, to guide us through that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, Dr. Kelly. Good afternoon. Again, good afternoon, Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I'm here this evening to provide you with an update on the new science standards and information regarding the changes to science resulting from the full implementation of the 2018 Science Standards of Learning. The, um, the full implementation of the 2018 science standards impacts the planning, teaching, and assessment of the standards. It is Virginia code to review the standards of learning every seven years. Virginia has been in an implementation crosswalk between the 2010 and 2018 standards for the last three years. This is not the typical timeline and was extended due to the pandemic. Therefore, this year will be the first year in which students will be formally assessed on the new 2018 standards. Let's see, am I doing something wrong? I have it on. Let's see. Yes, and that's touch. Thank you. Okay. In the forefront of all of the changes is the emphasis on the scientific and engineering practices. The scientific and engineering practices are included and identified as standards in each grade or science course. They do not include science specific content, they're overarching and understanding in nature. They're required, they are required components of what students do need to learn, and they are the same six practices in every grade level. So the scientific and engineering practices are developed throughout kindergarten through 12th grade to provide the robust science experience for students as they engage with science content. Traditional science content, such as the phases of matter, should no longer be taught as an isolated concept. Instead, the 2018 standards determine how the content is described in the curriculum framework, how instruction must look in order for students to learn the content, and how students will demonstrate this learning on assessments, including the Virginia Standards of Learning Assessment. So for example, rather than saying that students need to learn about matter, it may say that students have to construct a simple model to show that matter is composed of atoms and identify the advantages and the limitations of that model. So while students have been expected to engage in similar practices, the changes to the assessment outline how significantly the scientific and engineering practices are embedded in each individual test and Therefore, how they need to be embedded in our everyday instruction. When the standards of learning assessments are developed, the Virginia Department of Ed determines the categories for which student performance will be reported. These reporting categories are delineated in a document called the Standards of Learning Assessment Blueprint, which you see on the screen. In previous years, scientific investigation practices were assessed separately and were reported out in its own category. You will see an example of this on the left of your screen in the 2010 version. Beginning this year, the 2018 version of the blueprint, the science SOL assessments no longer isolate the scientific and engineering practices into a separate recording category. Rather, the practices are embedded into the test items in varying degrees and in the practices and the science con the, the scientific practices and the science content are assessed together. Like that example I shared on the previous screen where students might be asked to construct a model of matter and then identify the advantages and the limitations. I'm going to summarize some of the similarities and the differences between the 2010 assessment questions and the 2018 assessment questions. Let's start with what's the same. Students are still expected to understand key scientific concepts. Students should still take an active role in science investigation and inquiry, and students should be able to read on grade level. Many of the questions will still be in the traditional format of multiple choice questions with some technology enhanced questions. Here are the key differences. The embedding of the scientific and engineering practices into test items, 
The new test blueprint categories which indicate the number of items that will be included by content area for the test as a whole and the new introduction of a style of question for Virginia that are commonly referred to as cluster items. In these questions, students must integrate their content knowledge and knowledge of the scientific and engineering practices alongside a new and novel, contextually rich, phenomenon-based stimulus. Mm -hmm. So please note that these changes will only impact grade five, grade eight, and biology SOL assessments this year. Despite the adoption of the new standards, these changes will not impact earth science or chemistry. These courses will continue to test on the 2010 standards until further notice from the Virginia Department of Ed. The grade five, grade eight, and biology assessments will establish a new data trend for us this year due to this being the first implementation of the assessment. This may result in a dip in our student performance on the standards of learning for this school year. Biology has a unique situation. Due to our two terms and the new assessments being administered for the first time this spring, we will have students testing on both the 2018 and 2010 standards. Students who are enrolled in biology for the first time during our term two will be administered the biology test based on the 2018 science standards of learning. Students who were enrolled in biology for the first time during, during and prior to term one of this school year are allowed to take the test based on the 2010 science standards of learning. This includes seniors who need a verified credit in science. Administering the 2010 version of the biology test to those students attempting to graduate this spring ensures that the student's test results will be available within 24 hours of completing their test and prior to graduation. This slide highlights a few of the changes to the way students will be assessed beginning spring of 2023. On the screen, you will see an example of one of the practice cluster items for the grade five science SOL assessment. In this new question type for science, students will be pre presented with a stimulus outlined in blue. Notice that the stimulus includes text, an image, and a data table. Then students will be presented with a series of questions. The number of questions associated with the stimulus typically range between three to six questions. We have a handout um, that will be coming around and we're going to take a, a try at one of the, at these questions. This is gonna be the fun part. <laughs> So the answers are confidential. No one's asking you to turn them in and put your name on any sheets. Okay. But I think there, this is a really good example for you to see the adjustment and rigor that um, our students are going to be facing this year, um, which we all agree is a good application of learning model. But with that, we, we possibly could expect to see some uh, score differences. But that's been the same every time DOE makes a change with uh, the standards. Okay, so on your handout, you will find just a paper version of the two, uh, two sample questions that students will typically see on their screens, on their computer screens. So let's take a look at that first question. The first question says, select two changes the class can make to the investigation to show that work is being done. I'll just give you a moment. I would ask if anyone wants to answer, but I'll just go through it. <laughs> okay, let's see how we did. As a student, I would need to remember the scientific definition of work, which means that a mass is moved in the direction of the force applied. I would then select the correct answers, which are place a mass in front of the vehicle for it to push, choice one, and attach a small load on the back of the vehicle for it to pull. So I wanted to make sure that everyone knows the kids would actually have to click both answers. You can't just get one right. They have to click both of them in order to get that question correct. I know that's a little challenging, but just wait for question two. All right, question two. 
Based on the information in figure two, select the two trials for surface one that shows the most kinetic energy. I'll give you a moment. Okay, I'm using the teacher, I got your eyes, so I know we're ready. Okay, thank you. As a student, I would first have to navigate to the correct figure and surface reference in the question, which I heard you talking. That wasn't very easy in and of itself. I would need to know that more kinetic energy means faster. I would also need to be able to reason that faster means that the times would be lower numbers. I would need to pull in my math skills to order the decimals and then determine that the trials with the most kinetic energy would be trials one and six. All right, so I know that this gave a great example and this is why we really wanted to provide this as an example for you to show how those scientific and engineering practices are embedded with content and also to see how rigorous these questions can be. We didn't provide a um, handout for this one, but I did want you to get just an idea of what this looks like in biology. So this slide demonstrates parts of a sample release cluster question for the spring biology assessment. So outlined in the blue is the stimulus, which includes text, two diagrams, and a table. And outlined in red, students are then presented with a series of questions that are related to the stimulus. Again. Notice the prominence of the scientific and engineering practices. In the top question, students are asked to construct a conclusion by coupling their scientific knowledge with the information presented in the diagrams. Take a moment to view that top question. To answer it, students have to infer that the most likely change to occur first affects organisms in the closest feeding relationship. Students would then use diagram two to identify the octopus population to see that octopus consume shore crabs, sea snails, and mussels, and are therefore in the closest feeding relationship. As more octopus are eaten, these populations will increase, which leads us to answer choice C. I know, a lot to process. Now let's look at the bottom question. In this question, in this question, students are expected to apply their knowledge to this specific contextual situation to determine the availability of energy. This requires students to use their knowledge of the 10% rule, which states that only about 10% of energy is passed to each successive, successive trophic level in an ecosystem, starting with 1,500 kilojoules of energy. Students will apply this rule three times to arrive at answer choice A, 1.5 kilojoules. On the new SOL assessment, students will be expected to apply their knowledge in, more authentic, in a more authentic manner to the, the discipline to a far greater extent than they have. So, we have supported teachers and students through this transition. At the elementary and secondary level, this year has been an exciting return to science. We've been able to engage in hands-on activities once more without mitigations that had limited, that, that had limited um, us due to mitigations over the last few years. The new science standards have provided teachers with a framework for how rigorous science instruction can, can and should look, and through professional learning, curricular updates, and school level support, teachers have been supported in the implementation of the new standards. It should be noted that our teachers, instructional coaches, and administrators have definitely shown a commitment to providing students with high quality science instruction. And our students are engaged in learning experiences aligned to the graduate profile. Our youngest learners are planning their own investigations about the solubility of matter, analyzing school-wide energy data, designing sanctuaries for local organisms, and solving problems related to pollution in the ocean. Our students are definitely engaged in science. 
we will use the data from the new baseline that we will receive once we analyze the results from this first administration of the test. That information is going to help guide us and our work to support the success of all students as we prepare for the upcoming school year. I have a team with me. Please let me know if you have any questions. Ms. Milnick. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I proctored an SOL once and I don't know that I would pass this. I can tell you this, this is hard. And so with this being the first year, I'm especially kind of focused on fifth grade because yeah. it's a cumulative exam, right, for them, fourth and mm -hmm. fifth grade material. Yes. And, um, and I, I think you said that they've been practicing this format, this, mm -hmm. okay. And what you said that, we probably will see a dip in scores. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, what are we expecting? This is, this is a significant yeah. change. This isn't, um, this isn't just last year, I mean, adding a picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is significant. So. This it, reminds me a bit of the transition for the math standards. I'm not sure if you remember that when we transitioned to the um, processing standards in math. And we did see a dip for the first, we saw a significant dip the first year of the SOLs. And then from that point on, we used that as the baseline. And each year we began improving. And I, I, I think the state is preparing. Um, they've shared a lot of information with us regarding the science standards of learning. And there's a process in place to help schools improve uh, their scores because science is a part of accreditation. I can't tell you the exact number. We're very hopeful. We have um, done a lot of professional learning. Matter of fact, our essentials last, uh, for the beginning of this school year were all focused on the science and engineering practices. Um, and we are also realistic. So to your point, I can't give you a specific number or a projection, um, but we are really eager to see where our baseline is and we are well positioned. Our um, team has already been thinking about what are things that we need to do to continue to support teachers as we get this information and move forward. Like what professional learning, what supports are we providing teachers, what materials from scientific investigation materials. Um, we're, we're just look, using this as our starting point and having to move forward from here. So, I, and I worry about the teachers too and, mm -hmm. and how this is going to affect them. I have, I have great faith in our students and we're a top tier school, but I think about top tier school district, but I worry about everyone else and I have to question what is this and what what do they want to know? What does the state want to know? What yeah. so it's really about the application of student understanding. Mm -hmm. So rather than, than Is it though? <laughs> because I I think about the past SOLs and I thought that that they were tough also, but yeah. to 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 put this paper in front of a group of highly educated adults, and my first my first reaction was, wait a minute, I, I couldn't even get through, like I started reading the first question um, in one of them, and I had to read it three or four times. And so I worry about that, and I worry about our students who, I know we have no control over this, but I have to question, what is this? Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not a, it's a rhetorical. <laughs> well, I will say to your point about the teachers, I just want to note that that is a huge um, priority of ours is to ensure that our teachers feel confident and supported because they do take the su success of their students very seriously. There is no doubt they, they do 100%. And um, I listened to a group of math teachers today doing all kinds of really incredible stuff, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's pretty bad when the state is prepared for a huge dip and the answer, the question is, what are they going to do to to make sure that, I, I don't know. Okay, Miss Manning. Yeah, question on who is assessed in, on, on the different tests. So, if I'm a sophomore taking biology this year, 
and uh, for some reason I can't take the SOL this year, mm -hmm. um, and I want to take it next year. I would still be assessed. I could still take the 2010 assessment since I've been taught kind of under the old model. Have Mr. Goodman answer that. Thank you. Correct, but it depends on when you um, actually took the class. So yeah, so I it, take it this year, so well, it's not well, in that's what I'm place. This year. Oh, gotcha. Upon which term, gotcha. Okay. Right. right. Whether it's term, term one or, or term, term two. two. Right. Okay. So if they took it during term one, then they can still test on the 2010 version. Okay. Because term two, we're kind of changing our teaching methods, maybe, and. Right, because in term two, all instruction is based upon the 2018 standards at that point. All right, great, thank you. Ms. Williams. Yes, um, so I mean, basically the way I see it is they're just trying to make a complete turn off of memorizing and regurgitating it and forgetting it. <laughs> I mean, basically, is that what we're trying to do here? Just completely revamp and go a complete different way? Are we still, or or are we still going to have both? Spoke. Where you apply, but you still mm -hmm. have to sometimes memorize vocab words, mm -hmm. spelling words, and all that stuff. Because I think both are good. Yes, it's very similar, again, to the transition to the math. When we still have some basic um, computation and we have uh, questions that have those deeper understandings of the process standards. So it'll be similar. There will be some questions that are still in that multiple choice format, still asking some of those content related, but there's going to be more questions that have that scientific and engineering practices embedded with them and just a few of those cluster items where you have the stimuli and then the questions. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time, so we'll get a better understanding of what that's gonna look like after we do this test. Because we only have uh, a sample that the state provides us and it's not very, it's not very big, it's just a yeah. small sample. I mean, I do think as a student and as an adult, I think this is a lot more interesting to take if I, you know, it, it's just a lot, I don't wanna say fun, but, <laughs> It, I mean, it's just a lot more interesting than just rote memorization and filling in the bubble or rewriting a definition that you just learned or mm -hmm. whatever. But but I know it's going to be challenging because it's just a different way and a different thought. But I, I do think it's it's more rigorous and I think it's more um, engaging and I think it's a lot more interesting. So, but, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to C, Professional Learning Annual Requirement. Welcome Dr. Janine Gordon, Gorham, the Director of the Professional Growth and Innovation. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, members of the board, and Dr. Robertson. This afternoon's workshop will provide an update on professional learning for the 22-23 school year and a preview of professional learning for the upcoming year. Professional learning is a responsibility shared among all central support departments, as well as our school leaders, and I'm proud to be able to share our collective work. I would like to start with sharing information regarding professional learning for instructionally licensed staff, primarily teachers. The Virginia Standards of Quality require divisions to provide a professional learning program to not only support staff's licensure requirements and growth as an important driver for a high quality instructional program. I think it was telling me to breathe. <laughs> Our professional learning program for teachers is commonly called PLP. The PLP is aligned to support division goals found in the strategic framework Compass to 2025 and the specific and unique goals of each school found in their plan for continuous improvement and the goals and learning needs of the individual teachers. All of these drivers work together to impact student outcomes. Virginia Beach has a long history of investing in and supporting the professional learning of teachers. While there have been many iterations, the PLP began in 2001, which was our first comprehensive professional learning program for all teachers. The program included the addition of three days of paid professional learning to support the requirements that came with the new program, which included an annual mandated 22 hours of professional learning. 
for the 2018-19 school year, we shifted that focus of professional learning to be less about compliance and accumulating those 22 points and more about ensuring that all teachers have the necessary foundational learning experiences with choices for ongoing support and enrichment. While those 22 hours are not tracked, the three days continue to be part of a teacher's contract, and there is still an expectation that teachers engage in relevant professional learning. Our PLP consists of three main components. Essential professional learning is required professional learning and is differentiated by teaching assignment. Choice sessions are those that extend learning from essential sessions and serve to build capacity based on individual needs. The third component is site-based professional learning. These activities are determined by the school principal and leadership team and designed to align to the needs of the school and the individual needs of teachers. It is important to note how critical site-based professional learning is because that is where ongoing support occurs, whether it is through coaching, collaboration during professional learning communities or PLCs, or when central support staff, such as the Department of Teaching and Learning coordinators and specialists, push into buildings to provide support and customize professional learning. To summarize and connect all three components, you can consider the essentials the foundation that launches additional learning determined by individual need or school need, which might be provided through site-based learning opportunities or through division choice sessions. To provide you an idea of the scope and volume of the PLP this year, as of March 30th, we've provided 1,231 activities with 22,728 enrollments representing 5,963 staff members. These numbers just represent the division provided essential and choice sessions. Site-based professional learnings, those that occur at the school level, are still being entered into our management system. But you can see from our current count that even more professional learning is occurring at the school level. In addition to our professional learning program, which supports that licensure requirement, there are also legislated requirements. Most of these requirements are tied to an individual's license, such as child abuse and neglect training, dyslexia awareness, special ed training consisting of two online modules. It is worth noting that the Virginia Department of Ed provides free online modules to help teachers meet these requirements, but first sit First aid, CPR, and AED training requires hands-on training. Our division has taken on this responsibility so that licensed staff do not need to seek this training at their own cost. This year, 779 staff members have taken advantage of this training. As I shared, PLP aligns to our division's strategic framework goals, and this alignment often shows most strongly in essential requirements. Essential professional learning typically occurs in the summer because by definition, they focus on topics necessary for instruction during the school year. These typically are related to updates to curriculum, Virginia standards, we just heard about science, new curriculum resources, programs, and or technology applications. The examples you see on this slide are not all of the essential requirements we had this year, but do show how sessions are designed for specific teaching assignments often down to the course, ensuring relevancy and intentional planning for what is needed for that specific group of teachers. As you can see from this sampling, this year there was a focus on strengthening instructional practice, responding to student needs, and curriculum updates and resources. There are many highlights to share when it comes to this year's professional learning. These are just a few selected to show the diverse ways professional learning is supporting the needs of staff. On the January staff day, the Office of Professional Growth and Innovation, the Office of Family and Community Engagement, and the Departments of Teaching and Learning and Human Resources hosted the annual Professional Learning for Teacher Assistance Day. This day offered a menu of face-to-face -face workshops with 981 enrollments in 58 sessions with topics such as brain breaks, behavioral supports and interventions, literacy instruction, and the path to a provisional teaching license. 
To support our teachers who have a provisional license, the Office of Professional Growth and Innovation purchased 60 study.com licenses with online test prep coursework to assist teachers in preparing for praxis and other required assessments. We had more than 60 teachers request licenses, so just purchased another 100 to get us through this spring. We continue to offer the Teachers Reaching Use Intervention Training, Try It. Through a partnership with ODU, Try It provides the college coursework that enables teachers and teacher assistants to earn their special education endorsement. For TAs, that means they earn a provisional license and can be hired to serve as special ed teachers in the coming year. And this year to strengthen professional learning provided to our assistant principals with several series to align with the professional learning that their principals were receiving. These sessions were designed to build leadership skills as well as build capacity for the principalship. Now let's take a look at the upcoming year. And as we did previously, we'll begin with what is required. As you can see from this sampling, there is again a focus on strengthening instructional practice, responding to student needs, and curriculum updates and resources. I would like to draw your attention to the first course, which is an online course prepared by the behavior intervention specialists to provide all teachers with the skills and strategies to address and decrease challenging student behaviors. Another example I would like to point out is the mathematics conference for all secondary math teachers because it is a unique approach to mandatory requirements. The conference will be a teacher-driven conference to allow for differentiated needs while encouraging and supporting collaboration across schools. When it comes to choice, there are activities offered throughout the year, but in the summer, you might recall that last year and for several years prior, we have held multiple summer conferences, including the Innovative Learning Summer Summit, Pre-K and Early Childhood Special Education Conference, Title I Conference, and the Virtual Gifted Symposium. This summer, on August 7th, the Department of Teaching and Learning is excited to announce that they are consolidating their efforts into one amazing conference with the theme, Future Ready, Igniting Possibilities. Along with the efficiency of combining resources, this allows staff to have multiple learning experiences in just one day of the summer. This conference will focus on the first four goals of the strategic framework with a variety of different types of sessions and topics. This conference will be held at the Virginia Beach Con Convention Center. Just as the summer essential professional learning prepares teachers for the school year, the summer leadership conference does the same for our school administrators. This year's conference theme, Hope in Action, empowering leaders to create positive change emphasizes the belief that hope is not a feeling, but a call to action. The conference is designed to encourage leaders to continue leveraging hope as a strategy to create the conditions necessary for students and staff to thrive now and in the future. Learning experiences will focus on equipping leaders with the knowledge and skills necessary to advance the goals of the strategic framework. The audience for the conference is primarily administrators, with a small select number of instructional attendees. Learning and collaboration continues through the year at quarterly citywide meetings, monthly league meetings, summer short courses, and we'll continue to work to provide our assistant principals with relevant professional learning. We have long held a belief in supporting leadership development for career advancement and providing opportunities for staff to build leadership capacity and have several existing strategies. This year, we return to our successful leadership and management series for cafeteria and custodial staff, and we'll offer a summer cohort for custodians and a cohort during the 23-24 year for school cafeteria staff. The six-session series is in intended to support those who want to move into supervisory positions. Last summer, we started our fifth cohort of aspiring administrators with 28 teachers. Many of them have already received promotions, so we decided to expand by beginning our sixth cohort next year. The selection process is occurring right now. And our current aspiring principals cohort of assistant principals who are seeking the principalship is completing their first year of the program and will continue their second year with job embedded learning opportunities, including job shadowing, 
simulations, and collaborative problem solving. With a couple of exceptions, most of our leadership development work has been focused on school administrators, which has left some gaps because there are leadership roles and opportunities across the division beyond school administration. We are very proud to announce two new opportunities for the upcoming school year. Aspiring Leaders is designed for school staff who might be uncertain what leadership path they want, or those who know they don't want to be a school administrator, but might be interested in a central support position, or just to be a better leader in their current role, for example, as a coach or a teacher leader. The Advancing Leaders pathway is for current central support staff who want to build their leadership capacity for their current position or for career advancement. Both are one-year pathways and we are currently in the application process and have had a very enthusiastic response. I want to close by talking about non-instructional staff members and sharing information regarding professional learning for those. Professional learning for non-instructional staff has opportunities for job-specific skill training or learning necessary for career advancement. Job-specific skills are addressed through departments that support and oversee those employees. For example, the transportation office provides training for bus drivers to help them to be successful in their role. Power skills are the skills and competencies that enable staff to be impactful and successful at their job that cross all job categories, such as communication, time management, and teamwork. One of the ways we support staff with developing those skills is through on-demand learning that provides these employees an opportunities to learn right at their desk, on their bus, or while taking a walk on their lunch break. We have two on-demand platforms. We have a learning on-the-go collection of 31 podcasts addressing a variety of topics. In the past year, we've had 513 enrollments. In addition, in partnership with the Department of Technology, we are promoting Udemy, an online learning platform that enables staff to have access to over 20,000 courses. While this is not a new application for us, this year we have significantly increased the number of licenses in order to be able to provide even more staff members with this level of personalized learning. On the screen, if I had advanced it, you can see the advertisement we are currently using for Microsoft Excel class that we are promoting. This is just one of the classes offered. And that concludes my presentation that focused on instructional, administrative, and non-instructional professional learning. And at this time, I will be happy to take any questions. Ms. Franklin. Thank you, Dr. Gorham. Um, one of the questions that we had raised at the PPMC meeting, which I think is helpful to especially the, the newer board members that might get these questions um, from our team, is uh, the question about do we get paid for these classes and this professional learning? And I, you had mentioned that for instructional staff, it is embedded in their contract. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then did you want to, um, for non-instructional staff, um, is, is there any incentive for them to take the courses other than just enhanced learning? Um, well, there is always the opportunity for career advancement, and we do have an incentive program for that is through the off, um, Department of Human Resources. Um, for classified, there is an allowance that they can earn. There are certain criteria, and they have to earn a certain um, amount of hours in a time period to receive that. Okay, thank you. Now for your next show. <laughs> Not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, D, this is the mentoring uh, process for new teachers. Dr. Gorham. So this presentation will provide information regarding our division's new teacher mentoring program. The mentor teacher program is a legislated requirement with guidelines from the Virginia Board of Education. The purpose of mentoring is to support both effectiveness and retention of teachers entering the profession. Notably, mentoring is intended to be just one component of the larger system that supports the growth and development of teachers. 
The design of our local program focuses on the intentions shown on this slide, which we believe support that overarching goals of improving teacher effectiveness, accelerating growth, improving overall job satisfaction, and increasing retention. Let's begin with an overview of the structure of our program. By design, the program is school-based, which allows for support to be differentiated to the needs of each school and each teacher. The Virginia guidelines specify that the mentor should be in the same school as the new teacher. At each school, either the principal or an assistant principal works closely with their selected lead mentor to oversee support for beginning teachers. Together, they match qualifying beginning teachers with mentors. Lead mentors train their school mentors, organize an orientation welcome, and hold support meetings that focus on the needs of those teachers. Mentors meet on a regular basis to provide guidance, feedback, and a listening ear to mentees. They submit monthly logs, which are reviewed by lead mentors, thus ensuring non-evaluative oversight of the work being done to support beginning teachers. Lead mentors then submit a summary report directly to their administrators. You will note that lead mentors and, mentor, lead mentors and mentors receive $300 a semester or $600 a year. There are limited situations in which a mentor might work with two beginning teachers and then will receive $300 for each beginning teacher they support. Likewise, if the lead mentor also serves as a mentor for a beginning teacher, they would receive both stipends. Lead mentors are encouraged to make the best match between mentors and mentees and also limit the number of beginning teachers assigned to a single mentor. The Office of Professional Growth and Innovation, or PGI, provides centralized supportive mentors and lead mentors through the work of one professional learning specialist who provides training and support for those lead mentors and oversees the data collection and verification. The specialist works closely with the teacher retention liaisons who often connect with lead mentors and, and administrators as they align their support with teacher needs. The professional learning specialist who oversees and supports those mentors provides the following, beginning with paid summer training for lead mentors. Throughout the year, she engages with them through online monthly check-ins where they share successes and collaborate on dilemmas. She also continuously provides resources through a monthly newsletter, which can be used directly with beginning teachers or at the monthly school-based support meetings. I've been careful to refer to our mentees as beginning teachers because while the state guidelines refer to beginning and experienced teachers, the funding criteria only addresses true beginning teachers who have never taught before. We are often denied the submission of a teacher for funding credit who might have served as a teacher of record in a previous year, even for the briefest amount of time. Despite not receiving funding, we mentor all those beginning teachers, those who have never taught and those who have not taught long enough to earn a year of service credit, less than 160 days of teaching. We also are required to mentor provisionally licensed special education teachers and do not receive funding for those mentors unless the special education teacher is also a beginning teacher. In addition, we mentor teachers who need additional support to help them transition to teaching in Virginia Beach, such as those from other countries. We also to continue to mentor our late hires a full year. For example, if a teacher was hired in December of this year, we will mentor them beginning in December and then the entire following year to help ensure they have a solid foundation. Here's a snapshot of our current year. You will notice we are mentoring over half of the teachers we have hired. The ones we are not mentoring have teaching experience and thus do not need a mentor to help orient them to the profession. You will also note we are mentoring 122 teachers more than we are receiving state funding for. These include special cases that I mentioned on the previous slide, like experienced teachers who are from another country or those late hires. Our report to the Virginia Department of Ed is also due on October 21st. So while we will continue to pick up and mentor any qualifying teacher after that date, we no longer receive any funding to support that stipend. An exception to that are teachers who are also career switchers because we do have a second opportunity to submit names. 
So let's look at the funding. Our total expenditures have actually been fairly consistent over the past three years. We are on track to end this year with around $220,000 in stipend payments to our mentors and lead mentors. As you will notice, our VDOE funding does not cover the cost of our stipends. In 2021 and the years prior, the VDOE used a fixed rate for the $1 million allocated for the teacher mentorship program from the lottery proceeds fund. Beginning in 21-22, they adopted a new funding formula and now distribute the $1 million in a manner that provides a higher amount per first year teacher by weighting the per teacher amount for the severity of division's percentage of unfilled teaching positions. Quite simply, that means that the better we do at filling positions, the less money we could receive. This, of course, depends on how we compare to other divisions across the state. In addition to stipends, we also have expenditures for summer training that are paid with local funds. Our guidelines require that we evaluate our program annually so that we might continuously improve our support. On this slide are key findings from last year's evaluation. The majority of our responding teachers rated the program positively in terms of overall effectiveness, frequency of meetings, and their relationship with their mentors. Additional items ask teachers to report on the topics discussed, which we then use to plan for training, programming, and support for the following year. The first year of teaching represents a lot of learning and growth with new teachers, and the mentor is an important partner in guiding that new teacher through all those firsts that come during the year, such as their first report cards, first parent conferences. While most of our beginning teachers will not receive a mentor after their first year, I want to remind you that mentoring is only one part of a larger system of teacher support. We are fortunate to have many resources in place to support continuous learning and growth. We have Survive and Thrive professional learning sessions that are geared towards teachers in their first three years. Our teacher retained Retention liaisons are on call to provide in-classroom support. There are structures in place, such as coaching and our PLCs, and the supportive instructional specialists and coordinators. They all serve to meet the needs of teachers for collaboration, inquiry, and learning. And that concludes my presentation. And before I take questions, I do want to introduce Michelle Wave, Carol Bledsoe. She's the professional learning specialist that supports our mentoring program. Now I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ms. Brown. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you um, mentioning which resources are available to our teachers in that first three years. I have talked to a lot of teachers and they do find the mentoring program um, particularly useful, which this data here that you have presented shows that. But some of them have indicated that they would like to have the option to maybe extend that. Is that something that we're evaluating um, as a division? Um, we, we've considered it. It really comes down to funding. Right. We already fund so many over, and um, we do have a lot of, you know, I ended with kind of all the other supports that are available because the purpose of mentoring is really to provide help with that transition to teaching, to orient to the profession. By the second year, if a teacher has been there for that full year and they still need additional support, they may need support from a coach. They may need um, to focus on the work that their PLCs are doing. Mentoring may not be the answer. We do occasionally have situations where we have made exceptions to that. Usually the principal will reach out and um, sometimes it happens where we get an experienced teacher who's been away from teaching for a long time that comes back in and needs a mentor. We make exceptions. So there's, while I say, you know, we don't mentor past the first year, we do occasionally. Okay. But we do have lots of other supports and resources that might be more appropriate for those teachers. Okay, and so just as a follow-up, and I'm sure that you're already doing this, um, are you making sure that the instructional staff is well aware of what is available to them for that assistance? Um, I, I think so, and I think our coaches especially are very proactive 
in working with teachers, and I know that they are attending collaborations and meeting with teachers. But we do um, communicate regularly and directly with new teachers, so there's always a an opportunity for a new teacher to reach out to us, and we might be able to direct them to, to an appropriate support. Okay, thank you. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering uh, with the stipends, uh, they're broken down, looks like by semester. Is there a prorated version for mentors who start mid perfect? That's one reason why we do it that way because we hire new teachers all year long and right. that allows us to pick up and, and pay no matter when they start. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Great presentations. Um, before we go into closed session, we are going to go into closed session because we have 30 minutes um, and we have several things that we need to discuss. I just want to draw your attention, um, board members, you do have um, the clipped information that um, Ms. Regina Toniato gave us for um, the evaluation for Dr. Spence, so you'll have it ahead of time. Okay, so just wanted to point that out to you guys. Okay, so we're going to go into closed session. I move the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exceptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711 Part A, Paragraph 278 and 19 as amended to deliberate on the following matters. Discussion or consideration of admission or disciplinary matters or any other matters that would involve the disclosure of information contained in a scholastic record concerning any student of any public institution or higher education in the Commonwealth or any, schools, any state school system. However, any such student, legal counsel, and if the student is a minor, the student's parents or legal guardian shall be permitted to be present during the taking of testimony or presentation of evidence at a closed meeting if such student, parents, or guardians so request in writing and such request is submitted to the presiding officer or the appropriate board. Consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Eight, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. 19, discussion of plans to protect public safety as it relates to terrorist activity or specific cybersecurity threats or vulnerabilities and briefings by staff members, legal counsel, or law enforcement or emergency service officials concerning actions taken to respond to such matters or a related threat to public safety. Discussion of information subject to the exclusion in subdivision 2 or 14 of 2.2-3705.2 where discussion in an open meeting would jeopardize the safety of any person or the security of any facility, building structure, information technology system, or software program, or discussion of reports or plans related to the security of any governmental facility, building, or structure, or the safety of persons using such facility, building, or structure, namely to discuss A, student discipline and school security measures for specific cases, B, appointment of discrimination hearing officer, C, consultation with legal counsel regarding probable litigation and pending litigation matters. I think I need a motion for a closed session. And a second. Mr. Callan, all in favor, please raise your hand to go in a closed session. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass to go into closed.
Whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this day pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Okay, we have, we have a motion um, to close, second. All in favor, raise your hand. We have 10 ayes. The motion did pass.